Hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's Web Interface Support Webinar. This series of webinars is for Accountable Care Organization ACOs, and groups that are reporting data for the Quality Performance category of the Quality Payment Program through the CMS Web Interface for the 2018 performance period. These webinars will highlight important information and updates about reporting quality data and provide ACOs and groups with an opportunity to ask CMS subject matter experts their questions. During today's webinar, we will also share links to various resources and other information that will appear as announcements on your screen. Please note that these calls will only focus on reporting data for the quality performance category. We will not cover reporting data for the other performance categories during these calls. Now, I will turn it over to Lisa Marie Gomez from the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality at CMS. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today as ACOs and MIPS groups prepare for CMS Web Interface Quality Reporting. Again, I am Lisa Marie Gomez at CMS and a subject matter expert on the CMS Web Interface. Joining me today are other subject matter experts who will share helpful information on the CMS Web Interface quality reporting and answer your questions during the question and answer session after today's brief presentation. Today is focused on quality reporting, and you will hear us repeat that because we just want to make sure that folks you know, on this webinar realize, this. again, this is just quality reporting. You can contact the, the Quality Payment Program Service Center with any questions regarding promoting interoperability, improvement activities, um, general MIPS questions, or other quality reporting questions that may not relate to what was provided in this presentation. Next slide, please. So today, before we start the presentation, we just want to go over um, this disclaimer. So information provided in this presentation is current at the time of publication. The information provided is only intended to be a general summary. We encourage ACOs and MIPS groups to utilize the, the source documents and other resource materials from, um, for a comprehensive scope of content. You can access the list, the full list of materials via the links that are provided throughout this presentation. Also, for your convenience, we have provided the links in a pop-out box within the webinar. Please stay tuned for any communication from the Quality Payment Program your shared savings program, or next generation ACO model that is shared or provided throughout the CMS Web Interface submission period. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, and as you all know, the CMS Web Interface is now open for testing and will remain open for testing until Friday, January 18, 2019. During the test period, you will be able to download your sample, practice uploading data, and using the application programming interface, or also known as the API, prior to the start of the submission period. The CMS Web Interface will be unavailable starting from Saturday, January 19, 2019, through Monday, January 21, 2019. During this time, all data that was uploaded during the test period will be deleted. The CMS Web Interface submission period will open for submission on Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019 at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and will close promptly at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Friday, March 22nd, 2019. Your submission will autom automatically be accepted at submission close. As a reminder, the CMS Web Interface is, accept is accessible using the sign-in link on the Quality Payment Program website. Next slide, please. Please mark your calendars. The next CMS Web Interface webinar will be held on Wednesday, January 23rd, um, 2019 from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For that, web for that webinar, topics will include data confirmation report and data ir irregularities report, frequent assignment and sampling questions, PREV 10 overview, frequent measure questions, and then also a Q&A session as we do with every webinar. Now I'm going to turn it over to Oslem Tassel for further information. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Good afternoon, I'm Oslem Tassel. Today I'll be providing a quick overview of the CMS Web Interface API. 
Next slide, please. In addition to the Excel upload and manual data entry, the CMS web interface now offers an additional way to submit data via the Application Programming Interface, or API, which enables programmatic data reporting and real-time performance tracking. The API also allows you to build integrations with your software to test web interface data reporting. We have compiled supporting documentation to help users understand how to get started with the API. There is a narrative and swagger documentation which provide an introduction to the CMS Web Interface API, what it is, what it does, and how to authenticate. The links to both sets of documentation are provided in this slide. Should users need direct support, there is also the CMS Web Interface Google Group, the link to which is available in this slide as well. Next slide. I will now turn it over to Angie Stevenson. Hi, this is Angie Stevenson with the PIMS Measures team. And I just wanted to review a few of the frequently asked measures questions that we receive um, at the Quality Payment Program. Next slide, please. Question one is regarding uh, the diabetes composite measure. And question one is, when you say the diagnosis of diabetes needs to be during the measurement period, or the year prior to the measurement period, does that relate only to active diagnosis, or should we also look for a history of diabetes? The answer is CMS looks for um, an encounter with a diagnosis of diabetes in the administrative claims during the measurement year when populating the sample. When confirming the diagnosis for the patient in the sample, you look at the measurement year and one year prior if the patient has a documented history of or an active diagnosis of diabetes, they would qualify for the measure. Next slide, please. Question two is regarding the DM7 measure. What documentation is required for the numerator for the DM7 diabetic eye exam measure? The answer is when utilizing documentation in the patient medical record other than patient reported, you would need to have documentation to support the following. A retinal or dilated eye exam performed by an ophthalmologist or optometrist and the date of the exam for exams performed in 2018. For exams performed in 2017, you would need documentation of a negative retinal exam performed by an ophthalmologist or optometrist, and that the exam was negative for diabetic retinopathy, and the date of the exam. The actual report from the eye care professional is not required. Next slide, please. Question three is, we understand we can accept patient reported exams. Does the documentation of the patient's report suffice, or would we need to have actual report from the eye care professional? The actual report from the eye care professional is not required. For the 2018 DM7 measure, the following documentation is required for patient-reported diabetic eye exams. Uh, for diabetic eye exams performed in 2018, there must be documentation that the patient reported having a retinal or dilated eye exam by an eye care professional and the date, um, at least the year, of the exam. For diabetic eye exams performed in 2017 that are patient reported, there needs to be documentation um, that the patient had a retinal exam by an eye care professional that was negative for diabetic retinopathy and also the date at very least the year of the exam. Question four is, if our 
electronic medical record says diabetic eye exam, is this considered to be the equivalent to retinal or dilated eye exam? Uh, the answer is not necessarily. There are various tests done during a comprehensive eye exam which are recommended for diabetics. The medical record documentation would need to support that the eye exam was a retinal or dilated exam and was performed and reviewed by an eye care professional. Next slide, please. Question five is regarding the HTN2 controlling high blood pressure measure. Can a blood pressure reading be performed in an outpatient setting, including emergency department and urgent care, or only in a physician office? The answer is uh, blood pressure readings performed in the emergency department or urgent care are not included. You can use the most recent blood pressure reading documented in the medical record that was obtained during a visit to a provider's office or any other non-emergency outpatient facility. Question six, can a blood pressure reading performed in a skilled nursing or nursing facility be used? The answer is no. Blood pressure readings performed in the patient's home or residence, including readings uh, from monitoring devices or taken by an RN, are not acceptable for the measure. Question seven, can a blood pressure reading taken at an inpatient hospital visit be used? No, HTN2 is not an inpatient measure. So again, you would use blood pressure readings taken from an outpatient setting. Next slide, please. Question eight is regarding the IVD2 measure. I was reviewing the CMS measure specifications for IVD. I saw that, I'm sorry, I don't know if I can pronounce this, but Tigregreller is allowed to count as an oral antiplatelet therapy. However, on the IVD coding document, it does not list it, that in the Rx norm codes. Um, yes, this is an acceptable antiplatelet for the 2018 IVD measure for the numerator guidance in the measure specifications on page eight, and it does list that drug as an antiplatelet that is acceptable. Um, it's important to note that the coding in the IVD document is considered, in the coding document, is considered all-inclusive for the purpose of EHR mapping, but you may use medical record documentation to meet the numerator. And I also wanted to mention that both the generic or brand name form of the drug is acceptable. Next slide, please. Question nine is, in the 2017 specs for IBD, it says the diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease and or peripheral artery, arterial disease would, be, would not be considered confirmation of a diagnosis for IBD. However, this statement is not found in the 2018 IVD spec. Does that mean that PVD and PAD are acceptable for a di diagnosis of IVD this year? The answer is no, they, are not, they cannot be used to confirm the IVD diagnosis. If the diagnosis is not included in the IVD coding document the, on the denominator codes tab, it cannot be used to confirm the diagnosis for the measure. And I will turn it to, over to Katie Moore. Thank you very much. Thanks, Angie. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Katie Moore from the PIMS team. And today I'm just going to cover um, how to submit the uh, 2018 CMS approved reason request. Next slide, please. A CMS approved reason is a way to skip a patient attributed to a measure during denominator confirmation. These are reserved for circumstances that are unique, unusual, and not covered by any of the denominator exclusions or exceptions that are in the measure specifications. Patients for whom a CMS approved reason is selected will be skipped and another patient must be reported in their place for the measure if available. 
We encourage everyone to submit requests as soon as possible during the submission period to allow for CMS review. It's important to note that requests sent after March 15, 2019 are unlikely to be processed prior to submission close. No other CMS approved reason may be selected for the patient only when the request has been approved by CMS and you will be required to enter the case number into the CMS web interface. Next slide, please. This slide just shows the CMS web interface. It's an example of where you would enter in that case number if your approved reason request is, excuse me, if your request is approved. Next slide, please. To request a 2018 CMS approved reason, we encourage you to send an email to the quality payment program at qpp.cms.hhs.gov. Please only submit one request per patient per measure to ensure they're processed quickly and use the subject line 2018 CMS approved reason when submitting your email. The following information will be required for your request include the patient rank, the measure ID, and a detailed reason for the request. We encourage you to be very specific about the patient's condition and why that condition would prevent the quality action from being performed. The more you can provide upfront, the quicker um, your request will be processed. We also want to remind everyone to never include any personally identifiable information or protected health information in the request or in any follow-up emails. CMS will review the request and provide a decision, either approval or denial, in the resolution of the case. Next slide, please. On this side, we have some examples of automatic denials. So these are situations where um, we have previously received many skip requests. And um, these are examples of requests that will not be approved if submitted. So for IBD2, PREV5, PREV6, and PREV8, um, if these are not completed due to patient refusal, this is not an allowable skip request um, as the measure owner has not allowed any exceptions or exclusions for refusal. For PREV9, um, patients who are wheel, wheelchair bound um, or amputee patients are not excluded from this measure. The intent of the measure is not met if the BMI was not calculated and documented. Next slide, please. Okay, I will hand things over to Lisa Marie. Thank you. Thank you. So the next few slides will outline the available CMS web interface um, resources. Um, as previously noted, these links have been provided to you in a pop-out box within the webinar. Next slide, please. The items currently listed on this side are currently available on the Quality Payment Program Resource Library. We'll continue to communicate any future postings and upcoming webinars. Next slide, please. So this slide contains a link to the CMS Web Interface instructional video playlist. Links to the individual videos may be found on the resource library. Next slide, please. The help and support page at qpp.cms.gov contains links to materials such as videos, webinars, and online courses, as well as other items to help with reporting and development. We also have provided the links in the Quality Payment Program webinar library, where you can find materials from the previous CMS Web Interface webinars. So again, we just want to iterate that all of the information is posted within like the library. Next slide, please. This slide contains links to resources available for the Medicare Shade Savings Program and the Next Generation ACO model. So for any further information that you would like um, relating to those programs, please visit these websites. Next slide, please. And this slide contains contact information for requesting additional assistance, if needed. 
Now I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Michaela for the Q&A session. Thank you. Great. Thank you. If we could go to the next slide, please. And we're now going to start the Q&A portion of the webinar, and you can ask questions via chat or via phone. To ask a question via phone, please dial 1-866-452-7887, and if prompted, provide the conference ID number, which is 9766509. And please note, if you have follow-up questions or a clarification that you do want to share with us in the chat, um, please flag that for us by typing follow-up question at the beginning of your chat question. Um, so to start off, I'll read a few of the questions we've seen in the chat so far. So this first question is about the MH1 measure. So does the index date refer to the first date on which both the diagnosis code for depression or dysthemia is present, as well as the PHQ-9 assessment greater than 9 has been documented? Or does the index date refer to the first date on which the PHQ-9 assessment is greater than 9, while the patient can have the diagnosis of depression or dysthemia documented on any date during the denominator identification period? Hi, this is Jessica from the PIMS measures team. And the index date is defined in the measure spec, and it's defined as the date in which the first instance of an elevated PHQ-9 greater than 9 is also documented along with a diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia occurring um, at the same time during that denominator identification period. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is on PREV9. If a patient's BMI is out of range, does the follow-up plan have to pertain to BMI if the BMI and the visit were on the same day? Hi, this is Angie with the PIMS team. Um, yes, the follow-up plan needs to be documented on the same day as the abnormal BMI in order to count. Um, for example, if it said uh, the patient was counseled to on diet and exercise, um, as long as that is documented on the same day as the BMI, it would count. It doesn't necessarily have to call out the BMI on that date. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is, where is the list of diagnoses that can be excluded for PREV-12? Um, denominator exclusion, patients with an active diagnosis of depression or a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Hi, this is Jessica Schumacher. And um, that list is in the supporting document, which is a spreadsheet that is in the zipped file with the measure specs. And that's available on the QPP resource library. Thank you. Thank you. This next Next question is, if a patient had a colonoscopy, but it states incomplete on the report due to poor prep, does this count in the numerator? This is Jessica again. So, so no, this would not count as um, the intent of the measure is for the patient to have a colonoscopy completed and to then have documentation of the results. So. So unfortunately, if you're not able to, to show medical record documentation of a colonoscopy and the results, then, um, then it would not pass the intent of the measure. We recommend that uh, you screen through um, the medical record to see if there's any other type of screening that was performed, maybe as a makeup um, for that colonoscopy that was incomplete. Um, otherwise, if there's anyone else on the phone, uh, please feel free to jump in. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie, do we have anyone on the phone with a question? In order to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. That's star, then the number one. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so we'll just t 
uh, read some more chat questions for now. So the next one is, will the patients in the real sample be the same as the patients included on the sample file that is currently available? This is Kristen Williams from RTI, and yes, the patients in the final sample will be the same as the patients included in the sample file currently available. Thank you. Uh, for pr the PREP6 exclusion for POS32, if a patient is age 60 and POS is a 32, are they excluded or do they have to be 65 years old to be excluded? They would have to be 65 years old in order to be excluded with that POS. Thank you. Thank you. For the IVD measure, if a patient is taking aspirin and comadine, should they be reported as compliant or excluded? And in general, does an exclusion trump a compliance finding? Hi, this is Angie with PIMS. Um, yes, the patient taking aspirin and coumadin would be marked as a denominator exclusion. Um, in general, an exclusion, yes, would trump a compliant finding as long as it, it uh, fell into all of the criteria that was described in the measure for that exclusion. Thank you. Thank you. And if we were provided two discharge dates and one outpatient visit is within 30 days for both, does that satisfy the measure? Hi, this is Angie with PIMS. Um, I believe the answer to that is in the uh, question and answers document that was posted on the library. I am just trying to remember how to how to quote that answer for you. Um, could you send that in as a question to the quality payment program and I can get you that answer in writing? Thank you. Great, thank you. And Stephanie, do we have any questions on the phone? We have a question from Marty Gins. Hi, um, thanks for taking my call. Um, this is a follow-up question on the MH1 question earlier. Um, we have uh, some people who are interpreting it, uh, the specs a little differently, uh, especially with the use of the word and. Um, the question is, does the diagnosis of depression or dysemia have to be documented on that same date as the first PQH9 test that's greater than nine, or could it have been like um, it states active diagnosis, they could have been diagnosed two weeks ago, and now they're doing the test. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Yep, I'm pulling up the spec. This is Jessica from PIMS. So I just want to have that spec in front of me. So I know that, I'm running to the telehealth section. I know that there is an excerpt. Yep, and actually just to save time, I'm going to go ahead and let's skip to the next one. I'm going to look into this, the numerator just a little bit and um, we'll, I'll, I'll jump on um, after the next question. Thank you. Thanks. Great. The next question is on DM7 patient reported. Um, it doesn't need to be documented that uh, the person performed the exam or that it was done by an eye professional, correct? Hi, this is Nancy. Um, it does need to to indicate um, the date done and the um, it does need to indicate that it was done by an appropriate eye care professional in the medical record. Great, thank, thank you. you. And then I I think uh, a follow up question on that: Does it need to be documented who performed the exam? It just needs to be documented that the eligible clinician that did the screening, um, that the patient did report that it was um, performed by the appropriate eye care professional 
the name of the professional themselves is not necessary. Thank you. Thank you. This next question says, is there any guidance around how to qualify for quality submission bonus points? Do all uploads have to be done via the Excel format, or can it be split between Excel and direct web interface usage? This is Lisa Marie. Oh, go ahead. Thanks, Lisa Marie. Um, the end-to-end -end bonus points, uh, in order to earn them, you will need to uh, update beneficiary data via Excel upload or via the web interface API. Data entry uh, alone will not qualify to earn end-to-end -end bonus points. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is on the CMS approved reasons. Does there have to be a response from CMS in order to use this function, or is simply submitting the request and entering a QPP ticket number enough, although it may not be answered by QPP? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So your case must receive an approval from CMS in order to use um, the case number and enter that into the web interface. Just having the case number alone is not accepted. Thank you. This next question is, can we skip beneficiaries in rank order if they are patients of an ACO 10 that has since left the ACO? How do we report on that patient data if we can't access the 10 data? This is Olivia from RTI. Um, ACOs are expected to work with providers both inside and outside their ACO um, throughout the year, um, and especially during data collection to help coordinate care for their patients. In addition, um, because this TIN was on your ACO's participant list at the start of the year, it is still considered part of your ACO for the entire calendar year. Um, and you're reporting on um, the behalf of the eligible cl clinicians in those TINs. So it um, behooves the TIN to um, assist in your reporting. Great, thank you. And Stephanie, do we have anyone on the phone with questions? Do we have any questions on the phone? We have a question from Hannah Park. Hannah, your line is open. Hannah, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I think I must talk on the mute. Um, my question is a general question. That is, uh, we don't currently outreach for any documentation that are related to the quality measures um, for um, the purpose of the GPO reporting. However, we received some reports that relate to the patient um, test result, uh, which can tie to the um, the quality measures, and I was just wondering um, if whether we can use that information um, if it's a document in the patient chart, um, even though the information was came to us after the twenty after the measurement year. This is Olivia, and, and Mary, uh, feel free to jump in if you disagree, but if you wouldn't mind sending this question um, to the Quality Payment Program Service Center um, so we can provide a response, that would, be, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Great. So our next chat question um, is referencing question six that we had earlier on slide 11. So. Um, just a reminder, that question was, can a blood pressure reading performed in a skilled nursing or nursing facility be used? And so this person is asking, what if the provider sees the patient in a skilled nursing and the blood pressure is on a scanned progress note? Will that meet the measure? 
Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. No, that would not meet the measure. Um, skilled nursing facility is not considered outpatient, um, an outpatient facility. And also, it is in a sense where the patient, patient is re residing at that time and blood pressure is taken in the home or residence don't count um, for the measure either. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like uh, we have Jessica's ready to speak to that MH1 question from earlier. Jessica, if you want to jump in now. Thanks, Michaela. So I'm sorry it took me a while. Um, I was looking through the MH1 spec, and I'm looking at page 11, where it has um, the denominator guidance indicating that uh, PHQ-9 administration does not require a face-to-face -face visit. So, so the provider is able to to um, release the assessment to the patient um, outside of the visit. However, um, in order to claim that that screening, that, that assessment with the diagnosis, um, um, it, it has to be written in the documentation. The, the score and the result of that screening has to be associated in the documentation um, on the date of the encounter, the date of the appointment, with, with the diagnosis. So for example, if a provider um, released a screen tool a month out um, and then they had an appointment and they forgot to look at this, they didn't, they didn't document the screen, they didn't use the screen tool, then, then that wouldn't count. They would need to have both medical record documentation that, um, that the provider um, had that score greater than nine and then the, the diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia. And if that does not answer your question, or if you guys would like to discuss some of the conflicting information, um, please send um, us an inquiry through the, the Quality Payment Program Service Center. I believe that link was provided in the chat box. And if you guys have cases associated with this, please send a number, and we'll be happy to research. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question. Um, this person asks if you can please clarify what is needed for an interpretation of the screening in the PREV-12 measure, if using the PHQ-9 is a score appropriate for the measure intent. Um, I'd like to refer this, this caller to page 11 of the spec. Uh, it is documented in the guidance that, that there must be medical recommend there must be medical record documentation of the provider's interpretation of the, the assessment. And that means that they need to write you know, review assessment it's positive or negative for depression. And the definition, you know, positive or negative, is whether or not the standardized screening tool score is considered positive or negative. It's determined by that eligible professional administering and reviewing the standardized tool. If the result is positive, documentation of a required follow-up is then, you know, it must be in the documentation as well. Um, if you have any questions about that, um, please, please contact the, the Quality um, Payment Program Service Center and we'll, we'll be happy to look at any unique cases. But if you come across um, an encounter where it just says a Mr. Tool had a score of nine and nothing else, then, then that would not count. We would need to have that provider's interpretation of that score just because it, it can vary based on, on the patient, and, and it is up ultimately up to the doctor for PrEP-12 to determine whether or not, based on all the other information they collect from the patient, they, they are positive or negative for depression. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next question, this person asks to please confirm that any data downloaded via the web interface Excel on Friday, January 18th, will be able to be uploaded on Tuesday, November 22nd after 10 a.m. and all progress made will be retained. And I think they mean January 22nd there. So the test period for the web interface closes um, on Friday the 18th. So any data that was uploaded will be deleted. But if you download your sample, your actual sample, that's the sample you would use whether it's during the test period or during the submission period. But as, as we noted, any, any data that you download in terms of um, reporting for patients 
will be deleted at the close of the test period. But starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 22nd of January, which is a Tuesday, um, you can start uploading the data again to um, begin reporting for beneficiaries in your sample. Thank you. This next question is for the QPP upload. I noticed that when I upload my Excel file and the beneficiary ID type and provider one NPI type is blank. The file is still accepted and there are no errors. Is that fine? Um, could you repeat that question, please? Hi, yes. So that question, they're saying for the QPP upload, they notice that when they upload their Excel file, the beneficiary ID type and provider one and PI type are blank. Um, but they say the file is still accepted and it says there are no errors. Is that fine? Um, the, the provider fields are optional. Uh, whether you have the provider information or not, the Excel file will be processed. Um, if the upload file uh, is missing the beneficiary ID, uh, as a result of the upload, there will be an error on the screen. You can follow up uh, to correct that information. but the rest of the file with the correct data should be processed and accepted. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Olivia has um, some more information on a question we recently read aloud, so I'll pass it off to Olivia now. Thanks, Michaela. I just wanted to add to an answer that I had previously provided about an a TIN that had left an ACO mid-year. Um, and while I reiterated that it, um, we do expect um, ACOs to work with providers inside and outside the ACO, um, and those TINs that left the organization are technically still part of the ACO, I did want to add that um, if after a concerted effort um, your organization is unable to access um, the medical record uh, of the patients who are in that practice that left, um, then it would be appropriate in those limited circumstances to select no medical record not found. Thanks, Olivia. And Stephanie, do we have any questions on the phone? We have a question from Taylor Rogers. Hi. Um, our question is for um, MH1, does the denominator minimum of 248 apply still, or is there a lower denominator threshold due to the small number of members eligible for the denominator? Olivia, are you going to answer that question? No, I think that's for semantic fit. Could you please repeat that question? Yes, I was wondering, um, for MH1, does the same denominator of minimum of 248 apply, or is there a low denominator threshold due to there being a smaller number of members eligible for the denominator? Um, the minimum requirement 248 applies to MH1 as well. However, if you have less than 248 beneficiaries in, the, in your sample, you need to complete all the beneficiaries Thank in you. order to complete MH1. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question, uh, this person says, in their EMR, they have access to medical information that their patients have received from other providers or facilities electronically. Um, this functionality is available to the provider at the point of care. So just to confirm, are we able to use that information? And they say they're getting that from care everywhere. Are they able to use that info for any or all of their quality measures? Hi, this is Jessica Schumacher. So so the measure specifications do not um, provide guidance on, on 
what type of data to use. The rule is that you just need to have medical record documentation available so that um, the, the, um, the treating providers can have that coordination of care in which they understand the global um, issues and treatments that are impacting um, specific patient cases. Um, so, so I, I would say that any, any medical record documentation that's available, and, and I don't know if there's anyone from the auditing team who wants to jump in, but I, I just know from an auditing standpoint, um, they will ask to see you know, medical record documentation of, of the, the quality action. Um, so, so I think as long as you have it, you should be good. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, what is the time frame to do testing for the web interface API? Hi. The testing time frame for the API is the same as the uh, rest of the other web interface um, application testing. So um, this Friday at 5 p.m., uh, the, the testing or trial period will end. This includes the, the testing of the Web Interface API as well. Thank you. This next question is, were there any format changes to the Excel workbook from the December sample patient list and the final patient list that were delivered in January? Um, I believe there was an update made to the Excel template recently, and the most recent update is posted in the QPP resource library. Thank you. This next question is, if we correct data manually via the web portal after uploading data using the Excel template, does that still meet requirements for end-to-end -end reporting? Hi. Um, as long as you update uh, the, the measure via Excel upload, you will get end-to-end -end bonus points. Um, you can use the Excel upload in combination of API or data, manual data entry. Um, it doesn't matter in which order you make these updates, but the requirement is to use the Excel upload. Thank you. And Stephanie, do we have any phone questions at this time? We have a question from Darren Barnes. Thank you for taking my call. This is a follow-up on the Prev9 BMI um, question. In the measure specs, it says for follow-up plan, the doc documented follow-up plan must be based on the most recent documented BMI. Many of our providers uh, do I wait at every visit, whether it's a sick visit or a preventive care visit or annual visit or whatever, and having the most recent height in the EMR, electronic EMR, automatically ca calculates a new BMI. Um, many patients that are abnormal BMI are abnormal BMI to varying degrees consistently. Um, so as long as we, would it count if the most recent BMI, if we had at least counseled that patient on that BMI in the last six months? Or does it have to be that most recent? Because it will always be their last visit, no matter what visit that is. Does that make sense? Hi, this is Angie from Penn. Yes, that does make sense. Um, I'm going to bring this back up here, too. I think that I'm I want to look up about the height and weight um, because you said it was the height that you had on record. Right. Our, our, the, our policy is the height is, is least measured every six months. So if it was a height from six months ago, but the most recent BMI was a calculation from today's date because they remeasured the weight, it calculated recalculated the BMI, although they may have been obese six months ago and are still obese today and we counseled six months ago, what does it count? Sure. 
I get what you're asking. Um, thought there was something in here that did address that, and I'm sorry, I can't put my finger on it at the moment. Yeah, I haven't been able to see anything. Most of it's working on that. And okay. um, yeah, most of it says BMI on the current visitor of the past six months, except for that one statement in there. And then the guidance. Right. And okay. And I also wanted to bring up. I want to make sure you're you're looking at the 2018 version of the specs because the look back I, I period am. now. It's 12 months, I think. So. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll look at that a little bit further. But yes, I, but it's still, I think, in the uh, 2018 version, it still says, must be documented with the most recent follow-up plan, must be based on the most recent document of BMI under guidance, follow-up plan guidance. Right. And I'm thinking if that is the most recently documented height that you have on record, and it was within the look back period that it would count, um, okay. then that BMI would be the most recent. Let me confirm that, if, um, and I'll, uh, why don't you go ahead and ask me that at the service center so that I have time to make sure I'm correct, but I do believe that that, that is the answer. Thank you. So you want me to submit a ticket then? Um, yeah, I'll keep looking while we're while we're on, um, but we are running out of time. Does anyone else have uh, know that answer uh, for this? Yeah, and hi, Angie. It's Mary Schrader from ACO PAC, and there's guidance under BMI measurement guidance, um, height and weight, that says the eligible professional or their staff is required to measure both height and weight. Both height and weight must be measured within the 12 months of the current encounter and may be done uh, obtained from separate encounters, and you can't use self-reported values. So, Thank so you can put that right separate. It, it, it is on page 6 of the measure specification under guidance, uh, under Correct. heading BMI measurement guidance. Thank you so much, Mary. Correct. That's, that's measuring the BMI. That's not the follow-up plan. Guidance. Um, there's two different things. Right. There's measuring the BMI, then there's the follow-up. Right. This is this is addressing the question about. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Let's go with what your second question is. So, if as long as the the height. Um, so I was questioning whether the height could be measured at a separate encounter from the weight, um, and so this is answering that yes, it can. And I'm sorry. Can you re then can with that said, the can next, you repeat the question, the, your question? The next again? question is: Is can the does the follow up have to be with the most recent BMI documented? So um, if you look at the most recent visit first. Sorry. Um, and if it if there is no follow up documented at that visit with the abnormal BMI, then you can look back 12 months to find another visit with an abnormal BMI and a follow-up um, and document it. And then Thank that you. would that meet the intent. That answers my question. Okay. Thank you. Mary, if, if correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you so much for your patience. All right, thank you. And it looks like we have a follow-up question. Can you provide an example of what is acceptable documentation of a DMI exam? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Yes. Can you provide an example of what is acceptable documentation of a DMI exam? So B M I. Uh, D M. M is in Mary. Yes. Okay. So um, that would be uh, that is on the definition is on page six of the Prev Nine measure specifications, um, and that is the height and weight calculation. I know that there is also in the spec how to calculate it. Um, I'm looking really quick. Yes, BMI under definition on page six. 
it's the body mass in, index, and it gives you how that is calculated, um, taking the height and weight to come up with the result. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is, how long do we have to keep the records on file? Is this an ACO question, or is it for audit purposes? Does um, it specify in the in the question? It does not specify. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, if that we only have a few minutes, but if that person wants to specify in the chat, um, please feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, our next question is for patients that have measures in the over sample, do they not have to be completed? If they show as incomplete, will we have an issue with submission, or are we able to leave the measures that are in over sample blank? Hi, this is Aslam. Uh, the beneficiaries in the over sample are not required to be completed. Um, they are provided to, as, as additional beneficiaries in case you need to skip some of the beneficiaries in your, um, in, in, in your required 248 um, category. Um, you can leave them blank and optionally if you choose to, you can upload uh, data to complete the beneficiaries in the oversample. However, completing the beneficiaries in the oversample is not required and any data um, uploaded uh, will be included in your, it will, uh, it may uh, impact your score uh, f if, if you choose to complete beneficiaries in the oversample. Great, thank you. And I'm just checking and to make sure that we didn't get clarification on that last question and it looks like we haven't. So. Um, it also looks like we are out of time for today. So if we weren't able to answer your question, please feel free to email those email addresses for help with the Quality Payment Program, the Medicare Shared Savings Program ACO, and the Next Generation ACO. We did share those emails on a previous slide and also sent them out as an announcement that you should have seen pop up on your screen. And we also encourage you to join us for our next webinar on January 23rd. So thank you all for joining. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please hold the line.